Okay, so without further ado, I would basically like to invite uh, Johnson first to deliver um, the lecture, um, the lecture series entitled Housing for Marginalized Rural Communities. Please. Thanks so much, Taufik. Thanks so much for, for braving the rain. Um, after a week of really hot sun, I think it's quite a relief. Unfortunately, I had to fall at um, peak hours. Uh, but thank you so much. We really appreciate the uh, opportunity to share with all of you and for you to give your time to, to listen to us share our stories. Um, I'd like to say thank you to, to, to Pam. Um, I saw Dr. Tan earlier for, for really giving us the opportunity uh, where our collaboration, as Taufik mentioned, started in, um, during CLAF. Um, end of 2018, in fact, in planning towards CLAF, where we managed to really give access to um, architects all over the world to participate in helping our local Orang Asli community here in, in Malaysia. And we are so glad that it didn't just end there, but we're building on that momentum um, right now. Um, and so for those of you who, who are not familiar with when we started, um, this really built on uh, things had already been uh, has been established, um, and it's now evolving. And 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 we're hope, hoping that at the end of our sharing, uh, you'll be inspired to then join us um, in making this even bigger, or, or like we say, more epic. <laughs> and um, and and so, quite honestly, you know, when we saw um, what this series is about, I mean, it's this lecture in there. Um, quite honestly, I. I can't say that I am familiar with the format of a lecture. Uh, so there was some um, deliberation to do, you know, um, how much information are we supposed to share, you know, until you guys would get bored, you know, but then again, knowing architects, you guys like your details, you know, so we added more slides back into there, then we took slides out and put it, more, put it back in there again. Um, and there's still a lot of uh, information. And I, so I hope you, you would enjoy, you know, enjoy that. So I'm going to be sharing the first part really about what we're about, why we started what we started, um, and, and what we hope to accomplish. And then following my part, then Rachel, uh, my teammate, would then come up to talk um, more about the design, methodology, philosophy, and, and, and the details of, of, of that. Um, so without further, further ado, I'll, I'll uh, like to introduce ourselves. So as uh, Taufik has already mentioned, EPIC really stands for Extraordinary People Impacting Communities. And our, our vision is to see a world full of that. You know, and, and, and this comes as a uh, counter-narrative to where we see the world today, where you look at a lot of problems around the world and you can quite easily attribute it to human civilization, human population. Um, and, and so it's very easy to go Team Thanos um, and say, Let's just wipe out half the world's population. Everything is going to be okay. Uh, but what we've experienced is that there are many people that are willing to go the extra mile to try to make a difference. All they need is a platform to do so. All they need is a little nudge. Uh, all they need is the right environment to, to do that. And, and so that's essentially what we do. More specifically, our mission is to utilize um, grassroots level collective impact to enable social mobility within marginalized communities. So this is a, a new um, um, direction that we're taking ever since we've gone 10 years ago, where we started by just providing homes. But we realized that um, the reason why we provide homes is because it activates um, people from marginalized backgrounds to then aspire to, to go a little bit further. Um, and that's the best way we can describe it um, today. Um, and, and so our, our method of, of, of change really starts by mobilizing resources amongst people who are thriving um, to then directly impact those who are surviving. And, and typically these are people who are struggling on a day-to-day -day in terms of basic needs like food, water, um, um, energy, um, shelter. You know? And, and, and by, by filling up those gaps, we then uh, give them the springboard to start aspiring and start working towards um, um, exiting poverty. 
And, and our hope is that um, those, they will then evolve uh, or transition to um, a level of striving and very soon eventually lead them to thriving. And hopefully, once we get them there, our definition of impact is that these people would not just enjoy life, but they would then continue to help other people as well. And, and so Epic Homes is our key initiative that we've been working on for, for most of the lifespan of, of Epic. Um, where its focus is building, building bridges or bridging the gap between rural and urban people, or building relationships through the activity of building homes. And it's intentionally phrased that way, and I'll, I'll tell you why uh, as we go into this. Um, our focus, um, for, for most part, is on the Orang Asli people uh, of Peninsula, um, Malaysia. Why Peninsula, some of you might be wondering. It's simply because um, of logistical constraints and um, a, a deliberate uh, decision to, to just focus here and refine what we're doing in hopes that by the time, um, once we can refine it a little bit further, then we'll easily be able to scale it to our friends in, in Borneo. So we do have aspirations uh, to go there as well. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the Orang Asli people in, 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 in Peninsula of Malaysia, um, there are about 178,000 of them, the last uh, census were uh, made. And so the last report was done in um, 2011. They, they do a census every, every 10 years. And, and they make up about 0.6% uh, of the 26 million population on uh, Peninsula Malaysia. Um, so they are a small number, and therefore it's quite easy to overlook uh, our Orang Asli uh, people. But they are a unique, um, amazingly resilient people with so much um, wealth in, in knowledge, in culture, in tradition. Um, and, th and that's one of the reasons why um, we continue to work um, with them. Mo the Orang Asli people are broken down into three main groups. 55% um, of them are Sinoi, Proto-Malays, and Negrito. Um, and, and these three main groups then are broken down into 18 sub-tribes. I won't go into them, but it's important to know that the Orang Asli is not a homogenous group. It's very easy to just say, oh, the Orang Asli people. But in fact, they are extremely diverse. Uh, some of them geographically, they live in different places. Some are closer to the city. Some are still deep in the jungle. Um, and, and they have different ways of hunting and different ways of of um, um, potentially cooking, um, and, and different ways of, of going about different things. 18 different sub-tribes, right? And, and, and while it's very exciting and fascinating, that's also where a lot of complexity um, emerges as well. And, and so coming to the reason why um, homes. Um, we find that for, for the, the Orang Asli people that we work with, um, most of them are those that are in transition between semi-nomadic lifestyles to those that are transitioning to more settler-type lifestyles, those that are closer towards urban centers. What happens is that um, as, they, as they make this transition, either by choice or either because society is just forcing them to do so, um, these are some of the limitations that, sorry, that then emerges. Um, so with the pressures of modern development um, and an increase of a lack of recognition of the indigenous um, way of life, then we see um, a, a reduction or degradation of, of land. And, and so access to land reduces, access to quality material uh, to construct houses reduces um, as well. Um, as a result of that, then they, as, as a result of that development coming in, they start to lose access to uh, food sources. And, and, and so um, they have to then go out and, and start working in order to, to survive. Uh, and, and because of that, then they lose, um, usually they would have the time to build their own 
uh, homes, but in this case, because they now have to work like us, then they, they don't have enough time to, to build homes, and, and there's not enough people to, to do it um, fast enough. Um, and, and because of a lack of recognition of the indigenous ways, what happens is, um, over time, there's a lack of pride in, in uh, or sense of pride in, in holding these knowledge. Um, uh, those that are now ex um, exposed to more mainstream education gets frowned upon if they still live the Orang Asli way. And, and so a lot, of, a lot of the Orang Asli friends that we know find it very difficult to pass on this knowledge to their kids because they're not interested anymore. And unfortunately, one of the skills is building. You know? um, and so because of these factors, one of the clearest tangible outward manifestations of this is unsafe housing. And, and of course, um, the numbers tell us as well that 35% of them are classified as hardcore poor and 77% of them are living below the poverty line. So that's just a little bit of information to, to help you imagine um, the, the people group that, that we work with. And, and so in terms of unsafe housing, how many of them exactly are living in such conditions? Uh, the last time the, the census was done, 12,000 people, um, 12,000 families was the, was the number. Um, of course, it's quite hard to, to be ex um, specific about it. It's been about 10 years uh, since then. I would say right now the number sits around 10,000, but I can't be sure as well. Um, we're, we're hoping that when census is done, we'll, we'll get a more precise updated number. And, and, and so just to go back, sorry, to, to this particular slide, this particular thing over here isn't just a picture that we got off Google to, to try to give a dramatic uh, effect on, on the problems that are being faced. This was actually the house of Pak Chi Hong. And that was the first uh, person that we encountered that exposed us to this particular need. Um, and, and quite simply, at that point in time, we, we looked at it and said, wow, you know, we've got to do something about it. Because he was living in that house, in this state, um, for about, about two years. And so we wanted to do something about it. Um, if I haven't told you already, I'm not an architect. Neither were any of my um, co-founders from the construction industry. And so our idea was to just raise some funds and then pass it to a contractor, get him to build, or get him or her to build the house. But then after um, further discussion, we realized that it wasn't just about the house, but we had questions about how did this man end up in this situation to begin with? You know, because if we don't solve and arrest that issue, then over time, even if we were to give him a nice house, a nicer house, that would just, just deteriorate and perhaps even become, uh, come back to this particular state. And, and so we started trying to investigate what exactly is this root cause of poverty? Or what exactly is the root cause of broken homes that look like that? Um, and, and so we said, let's speak to the man. You know, let's, let's talk to him and maybe he'll be able to tell us. And, and upon trying to have that conversation, we realized that we we're getting nowhere for two reasons. One was simply because we were from the city. And because we are from the city, we don't know their lifestyle. And because we don't know their lifestyle, we're not familiar with it, then we don't know the right questions to ask. We're biased. Um, and, and, and so we weren't getting the kind of answers or information that we needed. Um, at the same time, we realized that this guy wasn't telling us anything. You know, and, and we were wondering, you know, it can't be, you know, we, we feel so sincere. We do feel the care that's within our hearts. And how come he isn't feeling it? You know, and we realized that this guy just met us a few hours ago. You know, why is he going to now share with us some of his uh, deepest issues that he's, he's facing? And so we realized that there was no trust. And there was no trust because there was no relationships. And, and so this was the, the premise which changed our perception towards this particular challenge. So it wasn't just about building the house, but we then set out to build relationships as well with the hope that with uh, greater trust, we'll then be able to get access to more information that hopefully would help us together figure out what exactly is the root cause of, um, of, of, of um, the people. 
And, um, and, and so that was how Epic Homes got started. And so quite naively, we were saying because we want to build homes and build relationships too, so we want to empower people who care. It's not just someone who's just um, looking to make a quick buck. You know, we want people who sincerely want to come down, know the families, and get them to build the homes together with the families so that relationships could be built. And, and, and so because we didn't know better, and I suppose my, um, my experience in, in construction extends so far um, to my IKEA table and chair. Um, that was as far as I could imagine uh, construction being. And so that was what we set out to do. Make it as easy as possible for uh, people with no skills to put up houses. And on top of that, try to make it happen within three days. Because like most of you guys, you know, we don't have a lot of time. Um, the typical house that we, that's being built by the Orang Asli, uh, for the Orang Asli families, takes about two to four months, depending on weather conditions and, and whatnot. You know, and there's no way that most of us can take up two months or four months to go and build this house. And so at that point in time, we had the experience of building a toilet that we did in two days. So we thought, why not build a house in three days? Um, and, and, and so that was what formed Epic Homes, um, where essentially we, we look for, um, we get connected to communities um, where they live in such conditions besides living in uh, unsafe housing. There are families as well that we built for that live in uh, confined spaces where you might have four or five families living in 600 square feet, which doesn't make a conducive environment to raise a family. And so those are the kind of families that we work with. And then we bring um, ordinary volunteers um, with some training, equip them so that within three days, they can then build homes that um, kind of looks like like that. And, and so far, um, so it's been a 10-year journey. We started in 2010 as a crazy idea. We, we kind of laughed at ourselves. We did one home, and from that one home, it, we managed to um, convince more people to support us a little bit more to do another home in 2011. Um, and then it started to, to build from there. Uh, in fact, on a personal level, I, I didn't, I had, not even decided whether I wanted to do this in the long run. Um, but it was because we kept getting more and more support. We decided to just see how far we could take it. And so in the last 10 years, we've been able to build 159 homes. Um, we have built it in 16 different villages. Um, so far, we've identified 19 more villages now that we're looking to build in. We've built with over 6,000 volunteers. And impacted about 9,000 plus um, lives. Um, so, so in terms of providing homes, safe homes, what is our definition of that? So in our case, we're looking at um, not just the structure, but we're also looking at um, water, energy, sanitation that makes a home. Um, the kind of activities that we do involves building new homes, um, providing repair and renovation um, support, um, building toilets or sanitation systems, water systems, energy systems, and, and other basic infrastructure that um, is required. Um, on top of that, we provide insurance, fire insurance that covers uh, fire, flood, falling trees, branches, landslide. So essentially everything that could go wrong in um, the rural or, or tropical rainforest um, and thanks to MSIG, we can, we can provide um, insurance that would up to being able to clear the debris and rebuild an entire home. That's something like 120 to 140 ringgit a year. And of course, there's training for maintenance and repair um, and, and certain warranties that we provide um, for up to a year. And all of that is really to provide a stable platform so that they can be empowered to enhance their lifestyle. Um, and, and, it, and, and from a home that's being built, the outcomes of that would be not just a family receiving a home, but we're also looking at 30 um, future leaders, so volunteers who are building. Our hope is that now that they are trained, they can continue to build for other people. 
um, what we've seen is also them going back to wherever they come from, their families, their workplace, wanting to make a difference because it is quite a transformative experience. You know, even though we've done 159, if you were to sign up to build a home, the day before you'll say, crap, am I going to be the one that is going to not finish this house within three days? Is this even possible? And to, even, to be able to accomplish that together with perhaps strangers is a very empowering um, experience that would help you imagine what we could actually do um, on a daily basis. Um, next, we have the Paid Forward program, where instead of um, charging or the Orang Asli people money, they pay in sweat equity. They build three homes in return for their one home. The reason for that is really for them to build a sense of ownership, of course, and, and pride. Um, another is for them to learn the skills uh, so that they can maintain their house. Uh, and lastly, it's also somewhat an audition. Uh, for those who are interested in, in construction, then we provide job opportunities to, to them as well. Um, lastly, we have something called the Community Development Fund. Um, and the idea of the Community Development Fund is, um, think about it this way, right? Um, most villages do not have an external injection of, of funds coming into their community to look at long-term development. Um, most of their families are struggling to make ends meet on a daily basis. So very often, you know, things, are, things that are outside the household are left to deteriorate over time. And so very hard to, it's very hard to advance um, a particular community. So out of the many communities that we've been to now, there's only one particular community that has been able to generate uh, some sort of recurring revenue. And that comes from renting out space for, um, to a cell phone, um, for a mobile tower. And that gives them 5,000 ringgit a year, right? So 5,000 ringgit a year. And maybe every now and then an MP on Adun would have some money and that could amount to maybe an additional 2,000, 3,000 ringgit a year. You know? So think about it, right? an entire village, only 8,000 ringgit to look at um, repairing amenities, looking at uh, programs to, to perhaps push the community a little bit further forward. Um, and so what we've found is that every time we build a house, we bring 30 people in. This 30 people engage in an extremely emotional um, activity. And most often, after you've completed, you'll say, what's next? Hey, while building the house, I was talking to this guy and he said that these are some of the things that um, they would like to solve. Um, I've, while going to the toilet, I realized there's no toilet. You know, so can we do something about it? Um, and, and so in this, in this case, the Community Development Fund is essentially a subscription model that we're looking to introduce, um, where think about it at a minimum 10 ringgit a month. Right, 10 ringgit a month, um, um, let's, say, um, let's say 10, 10 um, houses. So that's 300 people, 10 ringgit a month, that's 3,000 ringgit coming every single month. Right? So 3,000 times uh, uh, 10, 36,000 ringgit every single year. You know? and, and imagine every single community that we activate starts generating their own fund as well. I'll get into a little bit more detail um, later. Um, and, and so, just to go back to the why, and I think it's super important to, to understand before we get into the technicalities of the design itself and, and why we're approaching it that way as well. Um, and so, the reason why we mobilize volunteers to homes with families um, in need is so that we can build a relationship between family and builders, so that we can develop a support system that can address key areas of intervention so that we can facilitate the power of choice, restore dignity and self-belief, and so that they believe in their own talent and capacity to make a difference within their own lives and the lives of others. So that's the ultimate um, aim for Epic Home. So although the most tangible thing is the house, um, but there, the house is really a tool to empower the people from within to drive their own um, development. And yes, there are many, many Orang Asli people who are driven and are motivated and whatnot. Unfortunately, for at least based on our experience, many of our Orang Asli friends has been um, 
living in a certain environment which does not encourage uh, them to, to dream, to aspire, to, to dare to, to, to try things out. Um, and, and I believe that's where um, this bridging the gap can, can really help with. Um, so that's really a broad overview of, of Epic Homes. How are, we, how are we doing? Is everyone okay? I know it just rained, it's getting quite cold. Um, some of you may have had a long day. Just wanted to check if you want to just dive a little bit deeper into, <laughs> in, into our, our process. Um, so I'll try my best to be as brief as possible. Um, and, and so one of the questions we get asked the most is, how do you engage the communities? How do you get connected to them? And how do you select the families? You know, because um, uh, creating the handout mentality is, is, is a, a, a real concern. Um, or creating an environment of jealousy you know, and infighting um, because not everybody can get a house at the same time is also a concern as well. Um, and, and so that's one of the, because the main goal is empowerment at the end of the day, these are things that we really take the time to ensure that the foundations are, are in place. And so we, before we start building or doing any sort of development uh, interventions in any community, we start with an activity called pathfinding, where we have a trained group of um, volunteers that we've trained in surveying and, and asset mapping. I would, I would add relationship, relationship building in there as well. So before any help comes to a particular community, they go in first to facilitate conversations to really get to the bottom of what exactly are the issues that are being faced. Um, and so the reason for that is so that precise and credible information can be collected as best as we can. Uh, realistically, um, although, although we may get connected, or, or all the time we get connected by either family members or NGO workers who've been working with the, the, the community for a while, government officers that's been working with, uh, with them. So there is um, a relationship that we would leverage on. But even if that happens, um, usually on first, second engagement, people are still quite shy, quite pensive, or, or they don't know how invested you are, so they'll give you the minimum information. But the idea is to get as much as we can. And the reason for that is so that the right solution providers, or the right solution can be prioritized and can be mobilized to create more suitable and um, sustainable solutions. Um, so a lot of times, one of the things that we find is that uh, in, in, in development, in, in community development or um, providing humanitarian aid, um, people get very reactive because it's a very emotional exercise. You see a very broken home and say, oh no, we need to do a home. You, know, you see a place that doesn't have any pipes or doesn't have clean water, oh no, we have to solve the clean water. You know? and, and sure, there are many instances where we need to address some of these key issues. But many times as well, we become victim to being reactive to these things. Um, the reality on the ground, as we've experienced, is that um, a lot of these issues are intertwined, interconnected. You know, so um, a broken down house may be connected to some other issue as well. It's not just in isolation. Uh, so what the pathfinders try to do is try to gather this sort of information and try to at least create some priority um, as to what is most important to that particular community itself, rather than go based on what we can, or what we have in hand. Um, and so, in in the process, we built relationships with the MPKKOA. So that's um, the the MPKKOA is the new name for J, what used to be JKKK. Uh, um, so basically, they're the, the executive committee of a village. Uh, the button is a village chief. Um, and then in the process of that, we would be identifying um, um, extra, uh, more extra enthusiastic people within the community that would like to help. Um, and, and we collect um, um, data and information. And that's then fed, if it's home related, then it's then fed to Epic Homes. Then we can start the process of uh, selecting families and whatnot. Um, in, in the case of selecting families, um, we hold a village-wide um, session 
for people to, to decide, the kampong people themselves, to decide what selection criteria they would like. You know, so normally, it would look, look at structural integrity, um, spatial conduciveness, and then everything else would be dependent on their context. Um, and so sometimes there may be a prioritization of children you know, who are going to school, and so we, we prioritize those families. Sometimes they say, let's deal with the old folks first. You know, um, and, and so for once they've decided on all of that, we'll do a village-wide survey, at least to the families that are participating in the program. Um, oh yeah, and, and the last thing is the commitment to participate in, in um, the Paid Forward program. And, and so once they've agreed, we'll go to each family, we do a, a survey, and then we have a scoring system to determine who gets it, uh, to create a priority list as to who gets it first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on. That list is then highlighted to, um, the list is highlighted to the, the community themselves, where they get to decide and see whether that's something they're agreeable to or they would like to modify. So very often, um, what will happen is you will get people say, no, 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 I think this doesn't quite represent uh, the situation because you don't know that every time um, it reaches rainy season, this place would flood. So I think number seven should be bumped up to number two. Um, and, and, and so that sort of exercise happens. Uh, and once everyone is, oh, sometimes there are also people who try to cheat as well, where um, he already ha lives in some other village, he has a house over there, and he's trying his luck. You know, and so the villagers themselves would say, you know, good try, but this, don't, don't cheat these people. And, and so they disqualify them. You know, so basically, it's just really empowering them to, to make their own decisions. And then they sign off on it, or they agree to it. And then that becomes the list. We green light the village, and then we can start building. The reason why we've done it this way is, of course, to give them the power of choice. But at the same time, what we're trying to set is um, a list where it's not just used by Epic Homes, but we're also hoping that if, let's say, a church were to come in, uh, Zakat were to come in, um, other NGOs or the government were to come in, they can just refer to the list because that's already been agreed by uh, the government. Because a lot of times, these people would come in and they'd have their own criteria where, unfortunately, it, most of the time, it's, it's pretty biased. For example, uh, if a church were to come in, then it might say, um, I, is this person a Christian? And if this person is not a Christian, we're not going to build for the person. A uh, person with a Zakat fund, obviously, would come and say, hey, you know, uh, Muslim or not. Uh, or, or if it's the government in the past, maybe it's like BN or not. You know, and, you know, so, so you have all this biasness, and, and that leads to a lot of uh, separation and fragmentation within uh, the community. Unfortunately, that's just the reality that's on the ground. And what we're hoping to do is, if these people, people were to come in, this list will at least be the starting point to give the people the courage to say, look, we've already gone through this discussion. You don't even have to waste your time to do a survey. Just follow the list. You know, who's the next one on the list? Um, essentially, that's how we start. Um, alternatively, what happens is that information gets fed to our collective impact network to then look at other basic infrastructure projects. Um, so that's really a coalition of different people that we're trying to bring uh, together from different sectors, from government, um, NGOs, social enterprises, and people from the private uh, sector. So I just want to show you, uh, um, just tell you a story about how uh, this collective impact network could really make a difference. So this is in Kampung Hulu, uh, Tamu. This is the first village that we started with, um, where after building about 33 or 35 homes in that place, they said that one of the main issues that they, and in fact, it, we moved to building toilets, and following that, they said, you know, we actually need water. Um, and, and so that was decided amongst the community themselves, uh, and, and, and so we started a, a water project. And, and this was really initiated uh, by the community them, themselves. And, and so it was quite a... Um, um, extensive operations where they had to hike, they had to use the orang asli knowledge to know where the water source, the sustainable water source would be, hike 7 km into the jungle, um, and then eventually pull pipes. Imagine 7 km of pipes, that's very, it's not light. Uh, pull it all the way in, uh, map out, um, we, we found an old farm um, um, water water tank, which the guy then um, volunteered 
to be used as the main reservoir, which would then be connected to sub uh, tanks or sub hubs, that, which then gets connected to each person's um, house. So first phase was done. Second phase was then in the midst of um, in the midst of connecting it to to different houses now. Right, so, so these are, uh, we have now reached this point. I think they're now, what, 80, 85, 90% now into the, into the project. So the next step would be to connect it directly to homes. So this is the first time ever they would have uh, water directly to their, to their homes. Um, and then we got Global Peace Foundation. So that's another member of the, the, the network. To then come in to teach, um, to do a WASH training. So WASH is a water sanitation and hygiene training. Um, to, to look at um, how to use the toilet, how do you maintain it, um, and, and other basic hygiene uh, practices as well. Um, this village isn't... Um, um, I, I think a lot of them have already been exposed to, to uh, modern living, but there are many uh, villages as well where they're actually not used to using these amenities. Um, following that, we, we also got the commitment from the local community themselves where they committed to paying five ringgit every month per family to look at the maintenance of this system. You know, and, and, and this is really one of the uh, success points built on trust and relationships that are being built. Uh, many times they'll say, you did it, you maintain it. You know, but in this case, um, there was an AJKIA that was set up um, and, and they then agreed to, to doing this. And so the impact that we've created is uh, 500 lives, 109 families that now have uh, water pumped directly to their house. And of course, all the different fringe benefits that they get um, as well. Uh, but to, in order to do this, it wasn't a small um, project. We needed different skill sets. So while Epic Homes may be you know, used to building homes rapidly and whatnot, um, we needed all these people to come together to really make it a sustainable success. Um, so starting with the AJKIA, so we had our local champions, uh, led by the Tok Batin himself, the village chief himself. Um, we then had to get Jakwa to talk together with other government agencies because it went 7 km into the jungle. We needed to work with uh, Jabatan Perhutanan. Um, and, and then we also had to work with the member of parliament as well. Um, and then in order to, to look at the technical stuff, it's not just us, but we also needed engineers without borders to, to really plan this water system. As an education partner, we don't have the syllabus, but Global Peace Foundation came in to, to give that at the right time. Uh, and we also need other companies to come in to provide the funding to, to make it happen. And, and so this particular project cost 300,000 ringgit. And it's not a small amount, yeah. But that, that's really the power of the collective impact um, network. Yeah, so in terms of just details on post building a house, then we'll look at six months um, architecture warranty. We're looking at three years insurance coverage, um, yeah, powered by, by MSIG. And, and these are some of the guarantees that, that we put in place. And so we're the first social enterprise actually that gives um, um, fire insurance to informal housing. I mean, in fact, um, all, and this doesn't just extend to um, Orang Asli housing, but to our other projects that we do as well. And, and lastly, very, very important step, it's the training of the Orang Asli people. You know, going through the handover process uh, and then training them on how to repair their house. Um, in the early houses that we did, quite honestly, we didn't really follow through with that. And so when we went back, there were uh, many issues that we needed to deal with, where quite happily, we just completed repairing um, the ones that we didn't really follow through because it, it wouldn't be fair for us to, to blame it on them because we didn't, we didn't really um, uh, prepare them or even warn them. Um, right, and so... So the reason for the home is really provide a platform for long-term planning or long-term um, development. And, and so I, I mentioned the Community Development Fund. Um, the idea of it really is volunteers would then become contributors of the fund in the short term. This fund is then used to develop the community. 
um, we look at finding local champions. Uh, and these local champions are not just involved in uh, community development um, activities, but they're also, um, we're also looking at job preparedness and matching um, uh, activities, where eventually they would then be contributing back to their community development fund. So think of it like uh, an another sort of uh, EPF. In this case, we're looking at talents contributing a certain amount and then getting the employer to also contribute a certain amount as well. Um, so at this point in time, we have spoken to a couple of people um, now, a, a couple of employers now, and, and you probably realize that we are, um, I think our country is, in, is uh, on the way to easing out from our dependency on foreign labor, and we're looking to, to depend more on local uh, people. Um, and, and so um, it's getting more expensive. For example, if you want to hire uh, one Indonesian worker, it costs about seven to 10,000 ringgit for, uh, the, to, to arrange the license. And then on an annual basis, it's 2,000 ringgit. Um, and so the ones that I've spoken to said, I don't mind paying maybe half of that to train and, and provide training and upskilling to uh, someone from a marginalized community to then be prepared to work with me. Uh, and, and they wouldn't mind doing this because in the long run, they're building goodwill uh, with the local community who could potentially become the source of manpower for the growth of their business as well. Um, and, and so um, partners basically are companies that built with us. I, I have not mentioned this, but how we've been able to sustain ourselves as a social enterprise is where we sell this experience to companies as a team building exercise. Um, and so 70% of the 159 homes actually come from companies wanting to do it as a team building exercise, not as a corporate social responsibility exercise. Uh, and so many companies do it, and then following that, we want to get them to start investing in the long-term development of, uh, of these communities. But eventually, as we build this part, then the idea is that the community is able to independently sustain their community development fund. So over time, um, the amount of funds that they need to depend on from the outside starts to reduce and they start to, to increase um, their, their own funds. Right. So, so that funds would then be used for other infrastructure or welfare um, um, solutions. Um, the goal would be to turn, um, to activate them to become active contributors of their community. Um, currently, we have a prototype uh, entrepreneurial um, um, programs as well. And so two micro enterprises or two social enterprises has emerged uh, through relationships between the volunteer and Orang Asli families. Uh, so one of them is called the Asli Co. I'm not sure if some of you have, has anyone heard of Asli Co? Yes, one, right. So, so they are a budding um, um, social enterprise where they work with stay at home and single mothers to to um, make pots, handmade soaps, and, and now they're experimenting with other uh, products as well. They've managed to increase um, their income level of their household uh, by about 100 to even 200 percent. So most of their most of their husbands will earn about five to seven hundred ringgit a month. Now, um, being part of Asliko, some of the mothers are earning thousand ringgit um, uh, from 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 this. And then Native looks at Airbnb experiences, where they've now got five tour guides from within the community, and they've done may maybe 20 tours now, where they expose people to the Orang Asli uh, lifestyle by a carefully curated experience, which also reaffirms to the Orang Asli people that their, their knowledge and their traditions and their culture has value. Um, and, and and, and people from all over the world actually do admire that. Um, yeah, and so we hope to create self-activation and empowerment throughout um, our process. And I just want to do a time check. How are we doing for, for time? You okay? All right. So, um, so, so essentially the point is that at the end of this whole thing that Epic Homes and Epic, we exist to do more than just build the house. The house is really looked as a platform to look at self-empowerment so that 
each of these communities or families that we work with can eventually become sustainable in, in solving their, their own issues. And we found that a house is a fantastic starting point um, for self-empowerment. And so with that, I want, I want to hand over um, my time to, to Rachel to talk about the design. Hi, everyone. Um, I know you're probably a bit tired now, <laughs> uh, but I'll just try to be as quick, as quick as I can. I think maybe uh, design is something that you can hopefully resonate a little bit more with. Uh, so uh, I'm Rachel. Uh, I'm leading the design and innovation team in EPIC. Uh, and so uh, we have been developing the EPIC Homes model for many, many years now. And so I'll just dive a little bit uh, deeper into it. Uh, so to begin with, uh, I, won't, I won't go into too detail, I'll just look at the headers. Uh, our design process is very similar to our like, mapping process and things like that. Where we actually go into the community uh, we, uh, with the pathfinders, uh, we do asset mapping, but we also talk to the communities regarding design issues and what are their other infrastructural issues. Um, and through uh, engagement, we start doing asset mapping about understanding what kind of skills do they have. Do they have building skills? Do they have families who have building skills or, or any kind of other assets? Um, and then after that, when we have uh, honed in on a particular issue or a particular um, uh, infrastructure or housing need, we will then uh, co-design together with the families uh, of the village, uh, of that particular village. and. Why particular village is because every village, again, um, is quite different, especially if you're talking about uh, location-wise. You have by the sea, you have by the river, you have up in the hill. All of this has to be designed differently. Uh, and so uh, some has really small space, uh, maybe 400 square feet. It's like slope and slope on both ends. So we have to, we have to learn to cater to this kind of, kind of situations. Uh, after the designing, uh, we do our documentation and procurement, which is uh, a little bit different from the traditional uh, architectural firm where documentation, meaning you do all your archi uh, AutoCAD drawings, you do uh, all your technical drawings and things like that. Instead of doing that, what we actually do is we design a build manual. So a build manual, like what Johnson mentioned before, the IKEA style, uh, if any of you have built IKEA furniture, it's very straightforward. Everything is step by step. You have all your components. You just follow the instructions. Uh, so that's how we actually design our houses, is uh, using built manual. Later, I'll show you a, an example of how it looks like. Um, and then we do volunteer recruitment, and after that, we build. Uh, but it doesn't just end at building, of course. We then come back uh, for repairs, uh, but also refinement and upskilling, uh, as what Johnson has already elaborated. So through our 10 years of experience, we've heard many, 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 many stories uh, from the Orang Asli villages about the housing that they currently have and the housing they currently face and all the situations that, uh, that they encounter. Uh, a lot of it has to do actually with purely the house design because the PPRT housing, I think the next one, yeah. So the PPRT rural housing is very, it's very standard. Uh, it's four walls, uh, brick walls with the toilet inside the house. Uh, some have electricity, some don't have any connection. Uh, so uh, Orang Asli find it very difficult to, to transition to this kind of housing that's on the ground when they are very used to living uh, on stilts uh, and of course very lightweight material. Uh, so this was a huge transition and some of the ex uh, things that we see uh, along the way is people abandon the house and build their extension behind the house and they live in the extension or they convert it into uh, a storeroom or something. So uh, a lot of times, uh, they don't actually enjoy this kind of living environment. Um, so uh, another thing that is really challenging is that this is actually the uh, qualifying criteria for PPRT housing. Uh, if you don't fit within this, uh, you pretty much have to figure your own way around it, or you have to find an alternative uh, source. Um, 
So some of the images, uh, our pathfinders uh, community have uh, documented when they go into villages, they do document some of the uh, problems that uh, they face. Uh, so these are just some things that um, if, you, if you don't know, PPRT housing, actually uh, a lot of it is contracted out to uh, Class F contractors. So a lot of times, um, maybe they don't have sufficient skills or even the material quality is different. Uh, so we, we tend to see a lot of this. This one will be interesting. Uh, do you notice anything weird about this window? No? Ah. <laughs> window is uh, fixed upside down. So the water actually is coming into the house instead of you know, blocking it out. So stuff like that we see. Uh, this crack is uh, it's actually a concrete wall. It's cracked so big until you can actually see outside. So a lot of, uh, we, we see a lot of this and we start to ask ourselves, um, is there another way uh, than relying on Class F contractors uh, and also providing houses that are also still good um, while empowering the people in the process? So uh, this is an example of our build manual. Uh, this is actually a specialist. So he's just uh, reading the build manual. So we have done this build manual where it's a step-by-step -step process, tools and you know all the notes that, that is required. And the idea of this build manual, why it's so important, one is because it's pictures. You don't need a language. You can you know, bring it to France or wherever and you still be able to use it. So that is one, you're breaking the language barrier. But the other thing is that anybody can build, including the Orang Aslis uh, themselves, and also um, urban people who have no construction knowledge. Uh, and at the same time, because of our system, it's a modular building system, it's actually quite easy to control the quality because it's quite like foolproof in a way <coughs> because we use uh, steel, uh, prefabricated steel and, and uh, the wood, you just cut the wood and you put it on. So it's quite, uh, you can control the quality quite easily. Um, so with the families that we usually uh, deal with, um, uh, this is ge uh, generally their profile. Uh, parents with a few kids, uh, and a lot of times their jobs are very um, uh, basic jobs because, again, they have very limited access to education and uh, very limited opportunities. So at the end of the day, you have a, a, a community that's going into the urban context without the skills necessary to support for them to uh, thrive. Um, yeah. So uh, how do we actually get uh, all these designs up and running at the beginning uh, when Epic Homes just started. Uh, it's actually by pro bono architects uh, and uh, a lot of designer friends who came together to help develop the first Epic Home model, uh, the modular Epic Home model. And since then, we have had many, many people come on board uh, to help us out with developing it and improving it even more. Um, <laughs> yeah. So... Um, one of the things that we really hold very dearly in our whole design process is we, we ensure that our process is uh, an open and dignified design process uh, and that it empowers local communities to check, take charge uh, with the decisions uh, with their housing and, and things like that. So these are some of the students and architects that have actually come on board to design together with the Orang Asli families. Um, this is the design uh, that we currently use uh, over here. It's a modular housing. So this is one, two, three, four modules. Uh, it can be built uh, in three days. So we have three modules, four modules, and six modules. Um, at, at the moment, the engagement that we have with the families usually is very minimal um, because uh, with the modular system, we can, we, can, uh, we can move things around, but you can't actually change the shape of a module. So we can move the entrance, we can change the paint, but it can be better. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is an example of the booklet. So this is a six module, three bedroom Asli house. And when you open it, you have um, some notes and you have all of these kind of instructions on how to put things together. Uh, usually our build process, we have specialists and master builders on site. So this will be the leaders of the build uh, process where they would know best how to read the booklet uh, and then they will guide the teams to, to how to assemble the house. Yeah, so these are some of the designs that we had through the years. 
Um, this one is actually in Kelantan uh, during the floods. I think you all remember uh, there was quite bad floods uh, that devastated Kelantan. So we went in and we um, worked with the community and rebuilt one whole village. Uh, and these are just some of the other uh, examples and iterations. And we are continuously learning and un until till date, we still are improving the design. Yeah, so uh, this is just some of the interesting extensions that we've seen or additions towards the house. Um, a lot of the times the families would do extensions. Um, yeah, so with building, with the process of building the houses together with the families, what, what we've seen, even hearing testimonies from Jakwa and all of these people, uh, is actually a much higher ownership level uh, from the Orang Asli families towards their home. So they actually take care of it really well. Uh, you know, they plant their gardens, uh, they do really nice extensions. Um, yeah, they do additions to their houses. But this one is the coolest. Yeah, they actually built this whole, they even painted. So usually we have leftover material that they can actually use to do other small things that they want to do around the house. So they repainted the same colour as their, their main house. Yeah, so this is only just the beginning, actually, of uh, our journey. Like with Epic Homes, again, it's, it's houses, it's just us in, uh, in our five, village, uh, five states that we're doing. But that the problem is so much bigger than us. Um, a lot of, uh, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the CLEF 19 International Design Competition. Uh, I've highlighted uh, all of these issues that, that we face. Um, is that the Orang Asli, as Johnson mentioned, are being pushed further and further into the urban areas and their land resources are reducing quite substantially. So they're actually losing a lot of access to safe homes and their resources. Um, and, and by pushing or by logging or, or urban community coming closer and closer, they are then living a transitional lifestyle where they have, no, they have very limited connection to their roots but also not equipped enough to go into the urban context. So what do you do in between? Uh, and also lack of options available, like I mentioned about the, the PPRT housing. So if it's not PPRT housing and you don't have time to build your house, um, what are your options? So we have stories where um, Abang Faisal, for example, he built his house over a span of three years and he only, sorry, oh, five years. Yeah, so, and he only reached to build the walls. Uh, and he didn't have enough, uh, after five years, he only built the walls. Not even the floor, not even the roof, just the walls. Yeah, so uh, it's a really challenging situation. Uh, that's where we get into the Home Empowerment Catalog, which uh, I, I don't know whether um, you all have heard about it, but it's something that we hope to push forward in collaboration with PAM uh, and also JAKWA and the ministries. Uh, and the idea of the Home Empowerment Catalog is, yes, we have people uh, being empowered by building the house, but how can we get people involved with more involved with the design process itself? Um, so, with the home empowerment catalog, we aim to increase the power of choice for marginalized uh, communities. And as as you all know, a catalog has many many options. At the moment, they have one. So, uh, the idea of it is one is to create a much more suitable, the basic basic, much more suitable housing for Orang Asli in the rural context. Um, and at the same time also open up the, the power of choice. And we believe that by opening up power of choice, it actually restores dignity. Because I, I guess a simple way to think about it is what does a rich person and a poor person have different is the power of choice. Um, so uh, thanks to CLEF19 and the uh, collaboration with Pam, uh, we actually did a soft launch together with uh, Jaqua, um, Prof. Julie, and also uh, YB Weta Muti uh, from the uh, minister's office. Uh, and we actually are still in contact with all of them and we are hoping to push this up to policy level to actually implement uh, the catalogue as, as uh, a formal option for PPRT housing. Uh, this is, uh, we actually managed to, uh, along with Pam, uh, host an international design competition that uh, uh, that had 247 designs uh, from different parts of Malaysia and different parts of the world. Uh, and the two winning designs we actually built uh, during CLEF itself. Um, this is one of the, one of the winning designs. 
Yeah. So for this year, what we are hoping to actually achieve uh, is actually to launch the Home Empowerment Catalog with 10 designs. We have 247 conceptual designs that we have to actually extract, refine and convert into 10 designs that can be used throughout uh, Malaysia. Um, and so what we hope is that instead of having just the standard PPRT housing, now Orang Asli will have more power of choice through the design catalogue that we hope to, to, hope to achieve. Um, and how we see everyone working together is actually uh, government sector, Epic Homes, where we are on, on ground, uh, and also the professionals, uh, Pertubua Architect Malaysia, architects, engineers, all of you all, um, to come together to actually work on this. Johnson, yeah. you want to add something? Sorry, if I may, uh, Rachel. Yeah. Um, just if can you just go back to the last, uh, the, the last slide? Yeah. So I, I think it's very important to clarify that the PPRT housing is not the enemy. Um, it is really just the sole option at this point in time. And so our goal is really to see how can we actually improve on that. Um, we, one of the things that we found, or one of the things that we understand with the PPRT housing is that perhaps um, maybe a, a couple of years ago, it seemed like the best solution. But like many things, sometimes you don't try, you don't know. And so in the case of PPRT housing, that's been rolled out, but we found that it's limited in certain ways. And so when we look at um, selection of houses, it's really just give back that, that choice. In fact, it's not that we disqualify PPRZ, uh, PPRT housing altogether because there are Orang Asli people, some of them, that do like living there as well. And so we're hoping that we could now, instead of just giving them one choice, because, and we understand that it's sometimes more logistical, it's operational, it's trying to achieve economies of scale that determines what solution can actually be provided. But we believe that that's because um, perhaps the government body or whatever is trying to just do it on their own. But we're hoping that through by collaborating, we'll be able to extend the, the options. So that perhaps there'll be 10 new designs plus whatever that exists um, already. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, so, so at the end of the day, we hope to actually scale up grassroots empowerment in the design and housing sector. Uh, so how we look at it is using, by collaborating, using the holistic participatory development process together with design professionals and using design principles that are suitable and working with the government who has the capacity to scale, we can actually achieve this if we work together. Um, so, we have 247 conceptual designs, as I mentioned. We need 10 design firms or 10 design teams in architecture, engineering, etc. Um, to, dev to develop 10 buildable designs. And it's, like I mentioned before about our design criteria, it's not architectural construction designs. We're actually looking at, of course, developing the design, but the build manual and the material list, which are the two most important thing during in, in our development uh, process. Yeah, so, I mean, because we're here, what we're imagining is that, although we put architecture, engineering, M&E, and, and et cetera, um, we are uh, envisioning that the lead will be taken by, uh, by you guys, you know, by the architects, where through your network and stuff, this could also become a relationship building exercise together with the different um, um, partners or suppliers that you normally already work with and, and that you can then be become part of this, this legacy. Um, in terms of making it buildable, the reason why we want to make it as simple as possible is because we're not just, and this is very important that we clarify, we're not just doing this so that Epic has access to 10 homes. No. Um, the, the goal um, is so that other contractors can have access to this. Um, Orang Asli communities can ac have access to this. They can, they can use the material list and slowly buy parts and build as they go following the manual that they can download online. Um, um, and, and hopefully, yes, and, and so that's why making it as simple as possible uh, is, is very important in the process. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, so uh, this is just an example, a visual example. Uh, but we hope to, uh, by the end of this year, uh, have a catalog that is ready. Um, and of course, uh, contributors would be 
uh, acknowledged. Uh, and we hope that uh, you are all um, able to join us together on this journey. Um, the timeline that we're looking at actually uh, to achieve this 10 designs um, is uh, four months. <laughs> at the moment, it's four months, but it's, it's debatable. Uh, but by the end, uh, by November 2020, we hope to have all, all 10 designs. Uh, but uh, the requirements, I guess, uh, for if you do want to get involved, is that it's not just a design thing. It's not just, okay, I'm going to call my designers to design something. But we do want to go on ground, and we are working with Jakwa to identify different villages from different parts of Malaysia, uh, so that we have a variable, uh, so that we have a big variant of um, environment to design for. And it's not just this, you know, this open land with, with no constraints. So we are working with Jakwa to get a village list out, um, and we do want to work with all of you uh, and maybe your friends and whoever to actually go down to the village and co-design together with the communities uh, to contribute towards the, the catalog. Yeah, so, so we're imagining where um, we're, we'll be able to sit down with families eventually and be able to identify that, okay, this particular family lives by the hillside, very close to the water, maybe um, house design number three, seven, and eight is suitable. You know, so that becomes the choice. Then we won't, we won't perhaps use a house that's suitable for the sea. Um, and, and on top of that, we're also looking at uh, modularity uh, because one of the things that we hope to be able to put into uh, some of these designs is um, modularity to include more vernacular uh, designs um, so that perhaps some walls can be easily replaced by perhaps bamboo that can find uh, nearby by uh, atap. Um, 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 to make art up roofs and stuff like that, you know. So, so that's kind of what we're we're hoping to to achieve um, in the process of, of of this as well. Yeah. So, uh, at the end of the day, what we hope to achieve is that this catalog will be continuously updated. It's not a thing where it's ten designs and and that's it for you know the rest of our lives. But it's something that we can revisit uh, with the government. Um, or with our partners uh, to continue to expand. Um, and so more people will be able to access this, uh, this range of, of house designs. Um, and also in regards to what we hope to achieve on a policy level is that we want to expand the selection of PPRT housing uh, and also set in a design process that actually ensures suitability and dignity in the process itself. Um, and that the process will be reviewed, uh, design expanded every five to ten years. And um, at the end also, to model a cross-sectional collaboration where it's not just the government doing it, it's not just Epic Homes doing it, but we're all actually in it together and we can do so much better. Yeah. So, so we're actually on the verge of making this come true. This isn't just uh, aspirational. We, following CLAF, we've actually been in touch with um, the Ministry of um, um, Well, was it? Social Wellbeing. <laughs> Unity and Social Wellbeing, uh, that basically oversees uh, Jaqua. And, and so the idea is that once we're able to come up with um, um, this catalog, this catalog would then be presented to the cabinet. And it requires the cabinet to approve this to then officially recognize these designs as uh, PPRT houses. And the reason why I want to push that is the moment we can standardize this at least for the next five years is potentially so that we can achieve economies of scale as well. So we can start to identify different supplies and whatnot and eventually maybe bring the cost uh, down and make this even more accessible to, to, the, to the masses. You know, and, and, and I believe that if we're able to pull this off, this is pretty groundbreaking in terms of getting private government and civil society to come together and do something that um, uh, typically, if you are a centralized uh, government or institution uh, body, you're not able to achieve. You know? So this is pretty innovative. You know? so, so that's like the stuff that really excites us, and we hope that you can, you can join us. Yeah. All right, um, so just to end, um, I hope that you all will join us uh, to restore dignity through power of choice and make housing more accessible. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Um, next. Next. Oh, okay. next. Next. Right. Yeah. Thank you. If you <laughs> if you want to join us, uh, email Rachel. 
Uh, and we also have our bunting outside. Next to it, there's a basket that says, put your name cards here. So if you're interested to join us, please drop your name cards there or come and speak to us. Uh, and then we'll, we'll let you know what's, what's next steps. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Another round of uh, applause. Uh, God bless you both, um, Rachel and... Uh